What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Dual Sense Podcast. This is episode 28. I'm one of your co hosts. I'm Jason, and I am joined, as always, by Travis. Travis, what's good on this very special Christmas Day episode? Um, can't feel my face. I ate way too much pie. <laughs> Other than that, I'm feeling great. Cool. I'm glad that we we're foreshadowing here because. <laughs> We're, we're predicting the future because we are recording this right after last week's episode because we normally record on Fridays and Friday happens to be Christmas Day. So instead of recording, we are actually going to release this, this episode on Christmas Day so that maybe if you are traveling or you're tired of dealing with your family, you can pop us in for a little bit here and, and get a break, you know, or maybe pop us in while you've got your belly full and take a little nap. So <laughs> either way, here we are. And for this episode, we're obviously not going to be covering the news as we are stuck in the past and we're up to date as we record here. But instead, this episode, we're going to take this time to cover our personal top 10 PlayStation 4 games of all time. And with that said, the way we're going to do this is we're going to count down from 10 to 1 and we're going to alternate back and forth with Travis leading off here. And the one hole with his number 10 game. So hit me. Just just for the record, these are our top 10 games that we played. I'm sure yes. there are 10 games better than every game I picked. <laughs> yeah, these are our, these fine. are our yeah, these are our our personal right. top 10. So and off uh, just just so you know, I, I got down to I got down to 20 games. I got down to 15 oh, pretty easy. Okay. And then I had a, I had a really hard time getting it down to 10. Wow. Yeah, I, okay. I got splitting hairs. So, and, and we ahead. do, and we do not know each other's list beforehand. By the way, so, and I'm sure we'll have some overlap. That's fine. Um, yeah. I want to let you know out of the gate. I broke the rules. I have a 10 A and 10 B. <laughs> you got. A, you have an honorable mention. Okay. I yeah. thought about it. I thought about okay. it. That's cool. So, my honorable mention is uh, is by the way, I have six. Sorry, I have four games from 2016, which blew my mind. What a year for wow. me! Wow. Good um, year for you. Leading off is my honorable mention in the 11 spot or the 10 B spot is a dead nation. Oh, nice. So okay. Came out in 2014. Um, we beat this game in three weeks from, according to my trophy data, we beat it in three weeks. Wow. Uh, there are some <laughs> impossible. I was looking at the trophies. Some of them are impossible, like finish a level without taking any damage. I mean, you came and how do you do that? Right. But anyway, so impossible. This was like, um, if you don't know, Dead Nation, twin stick shooter from Housemark has a lot of, when I played it first, it reminded me of, of Rezo Gun, but a little bit off kilter and the way you use the sticks to could shoot it reminded me a lot of Rezo Gun. But my favorite things about it was the loot system was super satisfying. Like you'd find all kinds of weird stuff and trunks and um, cars and uh, dumpsters and all kinds of fun stuff. And it had the most satisfying headshot mechanics I've ever I, one of my favorites ever where you could charge the rifle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it would just like reel off 10 dudes in a row. And their heads would pop. Just pop, 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 oh, pop, pop. I, yeah. I forgot about that. And they would all pop and you'd be like, make that noise. Like, right. Pop. Yeah. And then, uh, then there was all kinds of cool stuff that I liked about it. Like you could uh, mm-hmm. set off car alarms and the, the zombies would run over and it'd blow up and kill all of them. Or, um, what else was there? Um, uh, like those really weird levels. Like remember there was like a circus with the clown level and then there was like a football team that ran out one time, but their, their pads were like armor. <laughs> yeah. I forgot I just, about that. I really enjoyed it. What and, a good game. What a fun yeah. game. That's a house smart game. Yeah. It's a house smart game. It's a house smart classic. So that was mm-hmm. my honorable mention. So I guess you want me to go with number 10 now with a real, real list. Yeah. Give me number 10. Leading off from, from 2016 and the first game from 2016 is bro force. Oh, nice. Noise. So, bro force. Basically, you're kicking ass for justice and liberty, and all you're trying to do <laughs> is get all. to the chopper. 
Yes. So, and it's like, it's just, it's like a six, it's like a 16 bit side scroller. And it is just like, it's a love letter to what countries think we think of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, they're not wrong. It's hilarious. And, yeah. And like the whole soundtrack while you play is like this glam metal synth music from the 80s. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> just like, da, 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 yeah. And it's um, heavy. The more, the more people you have, the more chaotic it is. So we were playing like four player co op and it was just a day, it was just chaos. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And the, one of the things I liked was each time you would die, you would get a new character with different abilities. <laughs> yeah. We would get stuck on these levels and sometimes you would die and the new character you would get would actually have a talent that you, you needed to get past a certain point. Like mm-hmm. you needed to have uh Rambo or somebody like that. So you died and you, Oh, I got him sweet. Now I can get past. So it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. And I wanted to give you, a list of my favorite character names from the game. Oh yes. I'm I was wondering if you were gonna mention the character names. Go for it. And if you haven't played this game, you'll get the idea very quick. <laughs> and these are not in order. These are just these are in the order that you find them in the game, but not in order mm. of my favorites. So we have Rambro, <laughs> Bro Mando, Bro Hard, mm. Brodel Walker, <laughs> Brominator, McBrover. Brobo cop gets me every time. In, <laughs> Indiana Browns, <laughs> Broban the Brobarian, yeah, Boondock Bros, Double Bro Seven, the Brolander, <laughs> Dirty Broey, and Broey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I haven't seen Broey. Wow. So uh, that was in the DLC, I think. So oh. anyway, that's Bro Force. It is a badass co-op game it's it's just it's everything you want in a co-op game and it's silly and there's no real like weight to it that makes you mad when you lose you know what i mean it's just fun yeah it's an excellent game and it's it's so fun in co-op and it's hilarious well my number 10 is cities skylines which is a city building simulation game on the playstation 4 and it is very in the vein of like uh, Sim City, mm-hmm. um, and it is so addicting. It I when I when this game came out, I was like, oh wow, this is speaking to me. I have to get this. And I played it when it came out, and I lost hours. Like <laughs> I would play it, and then I would start playing it at night. And then you know you're building your city, and you're doing all this. Uh, you know, making these buildings and and designing and doing the layout and everything and making something that, you know, that you want that makes sense and is efficient. And then like the next thing, you know, you look up and you're like, oh shit, it's three in the morning. Like (laughs) it's one of those, it's one of those games. Like, and then it's, it's also along those lines, it's a type of game where you're like, all right, I'm going to, I'm just going to play like, like five more days. You know, I'm going to make, I'm going to get this building researched and built and then I'm going to get off. And then you unlock something else. So uh, it is it is an excellent game. I would argue it's probably the best simulation game on the PS4, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very easy to pick up and learn, um, but it's very com- it can be very complex at the same time because, you know, there's you're managing and building a city, so there's all, all kinds of moving parts. So you can get as deep into the weeds as you want. Mm-hmm. That you're con, like I said, you're constantly unlocking new buildings and features, which you know would, would it keeps it fresh for you. And like I said, it gives you that feeling of like, oh shit, well that's cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that built. I'm gonna see what that does. Mm-hmm. And it always keeps you thinking about like what's next and where you're gonna put this building, or you're gonna put this monument, or you're gonna put the fire station, or you're gonna build the airport, and uh, you know stuff like that. And so. It just always would keep you thinking and engaged and challenge you in a way um, to make sure that you're designing something that works and makes sense. So mm-hmm. that was sort of the challenge of it. And then uh, also there's just a ton of it, of DLC for it, a ton. And I haven't played any of the DLC content, but they've added all kinds of stuff to the game that just makes it even more uh, you know, engaging and just more things to build and more things to do. So. As a matter of fact, writing this up made me want to re-download it and start playing it again. <laughs> but man, it's addicting. I'm telling you, if you've ever, if you've ever played like, uh, you know, Theme Hospital or uh, Theme uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, anything like that, this is 
this is for you, and this this might really surprise you and blow you away. So, is that addictive. the game with natural disasters? Yes, that's one yes. of the DLCs is natural disasters that I showed you, where you could right. uh, where you could have tornadoes rip through the city <laughs> and. You could have like a typhoon, like wipe out part of it and all that stuff if you're by the ocean. So what a great game. So anyway, that's my number 10. Yeah. And if you're if you're unsold on that game, which you shouldn't be at this point, but if you are, there are some pretty awesome YouTube videos of like you get people like recreating cities they live in or oh, to and yeah. just wild stuff. And there's and then there's also people that create cities and then just destroy them with like a, a dam that breaks. Yes. Um, those are fun too. Yeah. All right, so coming in at number nine for me is the uh, 2008 co-op banger, um, and you'll see a, a theme here, Far Cry 5. How nice. So, And I know people say there's better Far Cries. I'm sure there are, but this is the one that stuck out to me. It's also the most recent one I played, so that might be part of the reason that it's on my number <laughs> nine and not the other ones. But yeah, uh, this thing had the glitches that I love, the types of glitches that I love, like just weird stuff i don't even know how to explain it like guys would just like 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 you'd be chasing after a tanker to blow it up or something like that and they would randomly just run off the road and hit a tree and kill themselves hilarious Um, all kinds of weird stuff would happen um and like weird things like i was in the middle of a mission and they took off on a plane and i just shot at the plane didn't get the hit marker i thought i'd missed him so i stopped because like, well the mission's over it'll re you know i have to redo the mission and the dude just hit the ground in front of me it's uh no it's so funny it, just stuff like that and then you know turned around and watched the plane land in the road like it was great just crash and blow up mm-hmm. they had these really good secondary characters so one of the cool things they had was like yes. that gun for hire thing so yeah. you could bring in like whatever like a sharpshooter or an infiltrator or somebody who's good at being stealthy uh i think at one point during the co-op we had a bear that we used <laughs> we and, did yeah uh, that that was unbelievably funny that you're just like we would be sneaking up on like whatever and the bear would just take off and maul people <laughs> <laughs> yes oh god cheeseburger. I love so, cheeseburger yeah cheeseburger that's right um herc is one of the best secondary characters oh. i love he this is the shit yeah. he says is Hilarious. unbelievable like we to, the, to this day we quote things that herc says like <laughs> i don't want to assume anybody's gender like <laughs> yeah yeah stuff like he's that. just a, he's so funny so um and you know seed was creepy to me the main villain in in a sense that hmm. i could never figure out his motives um i wasn't really sure why he was trying to in the world or why he was really taking over the area um i know he says a lot of things along in the game and you can kind of pick up on those things and make your own narrative but none of them really felt real to me it, he's just a weird character and that's why he's so creepy to me is i can't uh, like grasp on to what it is about him that I don't like. That's annoying. Um, and then I love the Easter egg that you can beat the game in two seconds by just leaving it uh, on the first mission. I love yeah. that Easter egg. So yeah. And and part of the reason I love that, and I've told you this before is like, I've always wanted to do weird stuff like where it's this big triple a game and then you play it and it's literally five minutes long. So that's just funny to me. <laughs> or like, right. I told you the other day, like one of my favorite, ideas is to do a hallmark movie and then at the end um somebody just kills them all <laughs> yes it's just so <laughs> it's just so off the cuff right <laughs> you didn't um, tell me that yeah but anyway this game is lovely the shooting is a little weird sometimes the cameras are a little bit weird but uh the story's fun you get to do these um sequences that you hit uh you dreamlike sequences i guess you would call it yeah um, and that's, that's a nice change of pace and there's you know, you can do it super quiet. You can be super loud. It's it's a really fun co-op game. I think I beat it once with you and once with John. It's worth playing if you find it cheap and you got some people to play with. Um, it's a good time. Yeah, absolutely. My number nine game is Marvel's Spider-Man from 2018. And this was this game was really the return of the blockbuster superhero game that... Mm. Uh, and it did, you know, it was since Batman, since the Arkham games. And right. it was the superhero game that did the Batman Arkham combat better than Batman Arkham games, in my opinion. And mm. it was a very beautiful game at the time. It still is. And it had a good emotional story that even as someone who doesn't really, I'm not a big fan of Spider-Man, you know, it still kind of, you know, pulled me in and and had me invested in it. And 
The best part about it is though is absolutely the combat. It's it was so satisfying and challenging at the same time. And there are even there's people who I mean that that was what they did was they just mm-hmm. would make YouTube videos of like, you know, 100 and 200 chain combos where they, you know, beat up like 100 guys and never get touched and all this stuff and I was never that good at it, at the combat, and I don't even think I ever even used all of the gadgets that you can get, but Mm -hmm. I remember it being very satisfying, and I actually quit playing it the first time and went back to it later on and enjoyed it much more after I went back to it, and uh, it has awesome boss battles, including one of the best final boss battles that I've ever played in a video game, so it was very appropriately epic for a Spider-Man game, so... I definitely recommend it. And then one of the one of the last things I'll say about it is the movement and the web swinging around the city and through the game is absolutely phenomenal. Like it, it, it. I don't know how you could how else you could translate web swinging uh, <laughs> into a video game. Like I don't yeah, think how it can do you be done. It out? Yeah, I don't think it can be done any better. It's excellent. And it gives you a sense of like, just kind of like awe and like speed and, uh, you know, acro- acrobatics and whatever. So it's very, very cool. And I I definitely recommend it. Even if, even if like I said, you're not a big Spider-Man fan, it's a great game. So that's my number nine, Mar- Marvel's Spider-Man. Coming in at number eight, I have the Division 2. Again, great co-op. Great, great one. We spent days and days on. Yeah, um, I love it. And I'm going to start with the negative part that I didn't like. I hated at times that the bullet sponges were bullet sponges. Oh, yeah. Like, it could get super overwhelming. And there were certain games of the parts. Sorry. There were certain game modes that we never beat because we couldn't get past the sponges. Um, <laughs> right. And that was, that was annoying. So one of the things I thought was so interesting about the world of it, the kind of the open world that was kind of open, was that it was barren in a sense but it also felt like there was danger. Yes. And I thought that's kind of hard to capture in a game sometimes. I mean, uh, you're seeing that now with Cyberpunk, I think. It's just kind of barren and weird. The gunplay was good. It might be, it's one of the best loot systems in a game. The way you can um, recalibrate your weapons, that you can take them Mm -hmm. to the craft station, you can dismantle them. You know, it, the replayability is super high because of the different armors, the different armor sets, the way you can change your guns. There's also cool things they added from the first one, like uh, those rushers that would run at you and explode. Uh, oh, those were yeah. interesting. Um, that little battle bot thing that would chase you around. It was actually pretty easy to kill, but the first time I saw it, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and then one of my favorite items of the game that I thought was really cool is you had those signature weapons or those signature skills you could develop. Yeah. And um, my favorite was by far the grenade launcher, which is basically the war machine on Black Ops. And yeah. you could just light people up. Like, it might be a bullet sponge, but you can't handle the grenade launcher. And you could just, like, let people have it. Um, loved all that stuff. The grind was fun. It was fun to build through all those things. And then, you know, you get a weapon or a new piece of armor and you could, like, figure out which talent you thought was better. So even though right. they might both be 200 level, maybe this talent's better for the way I play or whatever. So, again, the only negatives I have about it are the bullet sponges. I thought the dark zone could have been better. Um, it wasn't as enjoyable as I wanted for some reason. I don't know. Right. I guess I just felt like it was... Um, It almost felt like an afterthought to me. I feel like it could have been really immersive or if maybe that was almost like a DLC secondary thing, it would have been better. Uh, That's just my opinion. I don't know. But but one of the reasons I like this more than the first division is um, the signature weapon. Fuck the division. Yeah. Fuck the division. With the stuff, (laughs) the guy, the things the guys would yell were hilarious, first (laughs) of all. And another thing that I really liked was the environment. So we had the DC museum. Mm-hmm. So we were in the white house. We had air force one at that one spot. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, those underground places we found down in like the tunnels and the subways and stuff. So all of it was really cool. It was really immersive. We spent a bunch of time on it. Um, it's one of the games that I could have got a platinum, but I didn't out of principle. So you're welcome for that. I think I'm like 85% complete. Yeah. You made me miss it. Maybe we should go back and get it for you. <laughs> Number eight for me is Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit recently, uh, obviously since it's a pretty recent game, but this game is just a stunning game. 
Uh, it's it has a completely unique aesthetic in terms mm-hmm. of the the colors and uh, just the visual design and the art direction. It's incredible, and it's one of the best looking games that I've played. But it simultaneously is not the best looking game. Like it's it has its rough edges, but it more than makes up for it in the art direction alone and the, and the color and then, you know, with the wind and everything, it's just a stunning game. It's a very beautiful game, first of all. Uh, but it's, you know, the other things about it are that it's an, it's an accessible samurai combat game that people have wanted forever. Like, you know, before you have to play like Ninja Gaiden or, you know, Tenchu, like these hard games, you know, if you wanted to do samurai stuff, and people have been basically begging Ubisoft for years to make a, you know, an Assassin's Creed game that is samurai. And uh, Sucker Punch, Sucker Punch beat them to it basically, and they right. did an they did an awesome job with it. It has some of the best melee combat of the entire PS4 generation, right. in my in my opinion. And it was just extremely satisfying to get into sword fights and to, you know, use the, the, the skills and the equipment, like the smoke grenades and all this stuff, you know, the way you could combine it, everything, and you could just get kind of free flowing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and parry and everything. Like it was just so awesome and so satisfying. And one of my favorite parts about the combat were always the, the Ronin fights yeah, that you could cool. find out. Yeah. That you could find out in the world and kind of these like scripted, like little side events where, just these one-on-one duels uh, with these guys, and they were so fun because they mm-hmm. all they all fought a little bit differently. So you had mm-hmm. to kind of figure out their 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 fighting style and encounter them and things like that. So it was really awesome. Uh, that the combat's definitely the best part of the game, and then the aesthetic is a close second. And then the other really cool things about it are the fact that it doesn't have any HUD, like you mentioned, like you've mentioned before, and uh, you know, no HUD, no waypoints per se, and which was an, a really unique and awesome design choice. You know, you would swipe up on the deep on the touchpad or whatever, and the wind would blow whatever direction you were supposed to go to get to whatever your objective was, which was so neat. And I think that by not having that HUD, that really added to the aesthetic of the game and made it look even better because it was just clean and open. You know what I mean? <laughs> and if it yeah. was cluttered, if it was cluttered, it would take a lot away from it. So. I kind of hope other games steal that from them. Right. So I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. But uh, it's an excellent game. And it's the hopefully the start of a, you know, a great franchise for, uh, or from Sucker Punch. So I also highly recommend it. Um, number, number seven for me is Destiny 1. Oh, okay. So again, another, another looter shooter, another co op banger. Um, mm-hmm. Give me the loot, as Biggie would say. Shout out to Biggie Smalls. I didn't think I would like this game at first, and I got it because everybody was going to play it, and I thought, okay, well, I mean, I'll try and see. What what do I have to lose, right? And they took, to me, they took the best parts of Halo and Mm -hmm. made them better, first of all, and they took all the shitty parts of Halo and either got rid of them or made them awesome. And... The world's one of the things I thought was really cool was like, you know, you go through the loading screen and you'd just be on the ship flying to a new world. Like I right. thought little things like that were really clever. Um, I know that they were just loading screens, but I like sure. it when they, they make you it just makes you feel like you're more in the game, if that makes sense. And yeah. it made it made the world the game world feel bigger. Uh it made it feel more realistic. You know, I remember we would go in every day, we would get our bounties, um, kind of like we would do on Avengers, we get our bounties. And we would go out and sometimes, you know, you would you'd pick your bounties based off of like what raid you were going to do or um, whatever planet we were going to go to. We haven't been there in a while. Uh, you know, we would go off and do that and come back. Um, I loved all of that. The loot was interesting. It wasn't as much fun to me as, as the division um, loot system. I like the division loot system better. But the reason that yeah. I have this above the division is the crucible. OK, I was wondering. Yeah, and we spent days at the crucible. I mean, we did. All, we did awesome. Everything. I mean, we we played the shit out of this game. I would love to know how many. I mean, I I put days into it. I would love to see what those actually looked like. But the the things I really liked about the game was I felt like the grenades were actually like useful, mm-hmm. and 
like Absolutely. even now, like on Call of Duty, I don't feel like they're very useful. Is they don't they don't have an impact. Like, but the grenades on Destiny for some reason, like they yeah. packed a punch. Um, but I remember like we would just cut and you, we would play Capture the Flag or whatever, and just we would yeah. kick ass. Like, I, I mean, it was just a lot of fun. It was like the first game since Modern Warfare Two that I was good at online. Yeah, and. I mean, we just played the piss out of that game and we played with everybody and it was back in college where we still had everybody together and, you know, nobody had kids and nobody had real jobs yet, kind of. And right. this, this is what we did, man. And we played the shit out of it. And most of my memories are just of us playing it, like the actual structure of the game. You know, it was the first time I'd seen bounties. It was the first time I'd really played something with loot that you could develop and strategize. It took me a while to understand, like, you don't necessarily just take the one that's the highest rated certain at certain points, but yeah. the loot the loot system I thought was simple enough for me who had never played like an RPG, an in depth RPG. Like it wasn't overwhelming. It, they made it easy to understand why you would take this helmet over that helmet, or why you would want this gun versus this gun. They made it really easy for me. So then when I played other games that were more complex, I could. It wasn't overwhelming, so to speak. Yeah. So um, I thought it was cool. Again, I don't like Halo, but it had it was like a fun PlayStation Halo. Is that a fair thing to say? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Destiny Two is free now. It's a it's a it's a free to play model now. So I'm just mm-hmm. saying we could always scratch that crucible itch one day. Okay, <laughs> we gotta have space first. <laughs> True. Gosh damn. Well, number seven for me is a game called Nex Machina, mm-hmm. and this is You'd another. Oh my god, I love it so much. And this is another Housemark game. Uh, the guys who did Dead Nation and who are doing Returnal on PlayStation mm-hmm. 5 coming out in a few months. And this game, Next Machina, is the most addictive twin-stick shooter that I've ever played. <laughs> and it's beautiful, and it's challenging. It's an arcade game, but it has high replayability because you're score chasing, basically. So you're playing the maps, playing the missions, and you're trying to make sure that you find all the that you that you kill everybody and that you kill all the special enemies that give you like score bonuses and you're in all and and trying to maximize your score and then you're finding trying to find the hidden uh humans that you're trying to save between the in the levels to give you more of a score bonus and things like that. So there's a little bit of like exploration in a way, I guess, and interacting with the environment, but just the way that you combine movement and shooting and then alternating between your special attacks that you can pick up was just so much fun. And it's like a thrill when you are like on a roll, like hitting, like hitting that combo and like doing it all correctly. And like you're killing everything and then you're using your special and then you're, you know, dodging all the bullets and all the shit that's blowing up and everything. Like, man, it's just so chaotic and engaging and there's just not really an an arcade game like it right now Mm -hmm. that I know of that is at that level. And I still go back and play it occasionally not right now because I don't have it on my PS five. Even Mm -hmm. though it's not a very big game, I I just don't have it right now, but I think about it often and uh, I can't recommend it enough. If you like either arcade, like fast paced games, or if you like uh, top down shooters or if you like twin stick shooters um it's i can't say enough about it you need to play if you haven't played it and any of that appeals to you you absolutely have to play it and it's pretty regularly on sale these days for like 4.99 so just keep your eye out and you can get it for like five bucks but in my opinion this is house mark's best game and it's everything that they that they are known for in their dna at its best so I'm really hoping that they kind of carry that DNA and that spirit over to Returnal, but uh, excellent game, Next Machina. I think I meant Next Machina instead of Resogun when I was talking about Dead Nation. Oh, okay. I, I, flip, <laughs> I flip those two games in my head all the time. Yeah, Resogun's awesome too, but Next Machina's better. Uh, number six, I have a game that I don't think you liked. Uh-oh. And it's my second game from 2016. It is Valiant Hearts. I want. I knew that was going to be on this list. So <laughs> I knew so, it. Um, this game came out like in the middle of the Great War Centennial, and the Great War is what World War One was called before uh, World War Two. 
Um, I mean, I fought in the big war, boy. So, so um, right around the time this game came out, I'd been ripping through my World War One books. Um, I'd read almost every one I could find. I just went to the World War One Museum in Kansas City, so I had, I was right. It was right up my alley, right. So, um, it's a it's a story based puzzler. It's a puzzle game. Um, you don't shoot a gun, really. Um, it's it's like, and what they did was, you follow five different people, but it, like this, the story is super sincere. It's not a fun story. It's there, although there are moments that are kind of funny, um, it's not a story with necessarily a villain. The bad guy is the fear of death. It's the war itself. Mm-hmm. It's not like a German or a specific general or whatever. You really only see one annoying German in the game and he like wants more food or something from you. But the art style is off the charts. It's cartoony. It's comic booky. It's, um, it's fun. It's like, it's descriptive in a cartoony way. It's kind of hard to explain without looking at it. I don't know the right word to use. And they did things in the game that you don't ever see in movies or other war games. Like there are piles of bodies that you can use for cover. And that, that was a real thing that happened. Um, right. You can fall into um, holes with, with gas in it and die. That's the thing that happened. But it also showcases like all the new machinery, which is what made that war so terrifying. You got tanks and zeppelins and barbed wire and gas. Um, all these crazy machine guns. The artillery is, it, even though it's a cartoony type game, it is, it's frightening enough on its own. Like you can, you can see within the game, like they really made an effort to show you like the main part of that war that was so terrifying was you didn't, you couldn't see who was killing you. Mm-hmm. If it's gas, if it's a tank, it doesn't matter if it's a bomb from a Zeppelin, like, <laughs> you don't you don't see the guy it's not per, it's not a personal war it's it's like really weird so for those reasons i love the game i love history so it's perfect for that and they have little cards that pop up and give you actual details about history and and some people i think complained about that they, they thought it didn't need those historic markers but i remember you know, those it adds to the game um it explains things that are going on and the ending is super sad it's super moving but they had to end it the way they did to highlight kind of the despair of the war and kind of what's bad about it. There's not a platinum for it, or it would have been my first platinum. Wow. Okay. That's that's high praise. I I did play that. I tried to play it, but I just I don't think I was in the right mood for it at the time. I didn't I didn't you know really get into it. So you love sad things. You should have loved it. I know you're right. I love to be sad. I would be a sad old bastard. Number six for me is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This is probably the first game that I really like got carried away in and carried away with <laughs> uh-huh, uh, that, I re- <laughs> that I really uh, sunk a lot of time into. And for me at the time, it was the standard bearer for open world games when it launched. There at the, really was nothing like it that we had seen in terms of having, you know, a rich world that was filled with all these meaningful and interesting side quests that gave players, you know, agency over the main character, whose name is Geralt, through the decisions that they make and the quests that they do. And there's all these callbacks, you know, and consequences as you play through the game based on what you've done. And in terms of like a, you know, a world that you've, you feel like you're always going to find something that you haven't seen before. Like this is it. And everywhere you go, there is something that you can come across or some type of quest or an interaction that you can have that you're not expecting. And then that's not even to mention the main story, which was epic. And, but it was long. Uh, It was a little bit long for me, Mm -hmm. but a very epic main story, very grandiose and everything. The combat was different at the time than anything I had ever played. Uh, it's a third person game, but the combat, once you learned it, because it, it was a little bit challenging at first, but once you got the hang of it, it was a lot of fun because you could combine like sword fighting with, you know, some spells, some magic. And it was good to kind of, you know, intertwine mm-hmm. those two things and, and use, use all of your skills to, 
be competent, whatever, I guess. And the, I think the best part of the combat, honestly, were the, as the game is called, you know, he's a witcher, so he, he hunts, um, creatures and whatnot. So to me, the hunting and the fighting of, you know, these trophy beasts was probably the best part of the combat because you, you would find these unique animals and they were kind of like boss battles really in Mm -hmm. a way. And you would kill them and then you would take these trophies off of them. So like, I remember the first time you, I came across something, it was like a Griffin. So I killed the Griffin and then I cut its head off and then I put (laughs) it on my horse to go turn in the bounty, you know, but she had to have proof. So I had this big Griffin head hanging on the side (laughs) of my horse and I had to ride into this town and turn it in. And that was just so awesome. Like there, there wasn't things like that weren't like happening in games. Right. And I think it came out in 2015. So it really was, like I said, a standard bear and it was an addicting game. Like I, I played it for over 300 hours when I had the, uh, when it came out and I played it so much that, uh, you know, 2015 for my wife and I was, you know, that was a time where we didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of money and we were just kind of just starting out. So we only had one TV in the apartment and I would, I would kick the wife off the TV, you know, to play games at night. And I was, I was playing the Witcher three there for a long time. And I've played it so much back then that my wife still to this day asked me when I'm going to play the Witcher game again. <laughs> she said, like, when are you going to play that Witcher game again? Are you never going to play that Witcher game again? I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe I, So I told, she asked me actually a few days ago, and I said, well, they're going to, they're supposed to be releasing a PS5 update next year. So if they do that and they make it look better, I'm probably going to go back to it. So, uh, and then it's pretty, pretty, I guess, world renowned for having some of the best DLC for a game ever, uh, or expansions, so, mm-hmm. which I still haven't played. So I'll probably go back and play those whenever they do the update, but it's an amazing game. Amazing game. Uh, number five, I got, uh, GT Sport. Okay. So I've played every Gran Turismo. Shout out to Polyphony, who I still don't understand why they're not called like polyphonic or whatever. Anyway, <laughs> that's that's how you pronounce it in America, okay? <laughs> um so when this game polyphony. came out when this game when this game came out, uh a lot of people were disappointed. There weren't a lot of tracks, there weren't a lot of cars, but since then they've done a shitload of upgrading. They've added all kinds of cars and tracks. Um they're very open about what what and when they're adding stuff um they listen to the community really well and they they change things based off of what we suggest and say whether it's adding new cars or certain tracks i think they let us even vote on a track Mm -hmm. and all that stuff's pretty cool that you know they just they did a really good job with this game so like you know if um dirt five is a one and iRacing is a five on a scale of realistic sims or realistic racing games, GT Sports probably a three and a half. Okay. Dirt Rally is probably a four. You know, you, you have all those things that make it fun. This game isn't like the other games. So the other games are built around single player, you doing all of your trials and getting all your licenses and yada yada, and then you work through like a structured kind of racing thing. To, you know, it's it's a racing game kind of like, but it's basically a solo game. This game, right. GT Sport, is based around online racing, and they have um world championship finals regional finals and all this stuff they've had them since 2017 um i've i've won our state a couple of times finished it by one i mean i've finished nice. at the top at the top spot i haven't like got they don't give you they don't send me money or a trophy or anything it's oddly addictive especially when you're in the solo stuff and you're trying to get these gold ratings on these tracks and these different challenges you basically start compulsively starting and restarting and starting and restarting because you know you can do it it, I've spent over. I've, it only counts to a hundred hours on the trophies you get on the game. So I'm over. I'm over that. I have no idea how much time I have in the game. <laughs> Pretty much all I do now is race online every week with this FIA seasons. Um, they're fun. I do sometimes. I do the daily races, but the daily races are like kind of a shit show sometimes. But it's it's the game that I like to sim race on the most. Um, I'm just the best at it. I've had a couple of top 100 times in, the, in our region, which is that's awesome. You know, Canada to Argentina, basically. So, you know, it's fun if you're into cars. It's fun if you're into racing. Um, the liveries for your cars are completely customizable, and there is some crazy stuff there. I usually either make or download old NASCAR liveries for my cars because I just think it's <laughs> funny. 
yeah. I think it's funny that they're not NASCARs and then I paint them like one. Um, but anyway, it's um, it's a lot of fun. It it takes it does take some skill. The guys that are good at that game are like on a different level. Um, my driver rating is a B, and it goes all the way up to S. So it's like B A A plus S. So I only have three more to go. I don't know if I'll make it there before the new Gran Turismo comes out. I doubt it. Um, I don't play it enough to do that, and I have other stuff going on. But it's the game I've probably put the most into. Um, and I have the wheel and everything. It's a blast. I really enjoy it. Yeah, it's that's your shit. Well, number five for me is Uncharted 4. And at the time that this game came out, it was absolutely the most beautiful game that I'd ever played, without a question, without a doubt. And it is still to this day an epic game with just over-the-top action set pieces. And it's still some of the best set pieces in any game. You know, they're movie quality. Some of the, right. some of the set pieces in the in the game are stuff you would see in you know in a Hollywood production, which I think is awesome. You know, Naughty Dog always raises the bar whenever they make these games. So um, the combat was typical Uncharted combat. You know, it was good but not great. But that's fine for the type of game that it was or is. And in my opinion, it was the best story of all of the series of games. Mm -hmm. It was the most uh, grounded, most realistic, the most emotional, and the one that was easiest to kind of connect with and get invested in the characters. Then also, I just remember the environments being so beautiful. Like they, at the time, like they were photorealistic at the time, like the closest thing to, the closest thing to photorealistic. And I remember just being, you know, stunned by some of the of the kind of like set like vistas or scapes that you come across, and mm-hmm. it was incredible. And the other part that I really enjoyed, kind of unexpectedly, that I think is really one of the best parts of the game are the the puzzles. Um, mm-hmm. You know, kind of solving like the environmental puzzles, so like you know, unlock a tomb and get the next you know section of the map or whatever. Like uh, those were very clever and very well done, and. I really appreciated them. And then the last thing that I'll say about it here is that it has one of the absolute best endings to a game that I've ever played. And from the final fight with no spoilers, the final fight is so awesome. Like, I think that's such, it's like, it's absolutely one of the best final like boss battles, if you will, of any game. And then on to the epilogue of the game, uh, the epilogue chapter was incredible as well. And talk about the graphics in the game, that final chapter, uh, that is some of the best looking shit you'll ever see in a game. So it's just absolutely fantastic. It's a great mm-hmm. game. Excellent game. Cracking in the top five there. My number four game is Uncharted 4. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that's back awesome. Back. Yeah, so like you said... The it, it, the it looks incredible. Yeah, it's silly. It's one of my favorite games to look at. It's the gameplay's fun, like you said. It's it's great for what it is. It's kind of arcadey at times, um, and that's fine. That it's it's a blast. The story is crazy good, like you said. Um, I really like the 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 very first mission you do, where you're like in the in the prison, you're helping them get out. Oh yeah, that that was a lot of fun. I like that we got to see. Uh, Drake, Drake in a different way. Yeah, all of that was fun. I will say one thing. I will say about the epilogue is I kept. I, I was for sure everybody was dead. Um, yeah, I know that's just how mean. I am. I, I don't know yeah. what it was. It was driving me crazy. But one of the things I really will say about the game that you didn't say was the companions you had in the game um, on Uncharted Four was some of the best companions I've had. They could actually fight and shoot guns. They didn't blow mm-hmm. your cover. If you were going stealthy, they would they would follow along. Um, that's nice. You don't usually get that. You usually kind of they just usually get in the way. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that was nice. Um, yeah. But anyway, like you said, everything you said is right. Um, you know, I like I like games with puzzles. Um, that's what I liked about the other Uncharted's was um, the puzzles are are challenging. Um, it's fun to it's you know I don't like getting stuck on them, but the thing that I like is getting stuck on them and then figuring it out without going to YouTube or a walkthrough. Right. So a lot of that was fun. I know that the tower, there's something on the tower. I remember it took me a while to get, I think I kept dying on the tower. It took me a minute to get that one right. But Oh yeah. Yeah. 
it was cool. The environments were awesome. Um, the story felt, like you said, it felt super realistic to the point that there were times where I couldn't figure out what the next story beat was going to be. And to say that that's rare, I guess, is maybe that's a little bit of an overstatement. But at times with movies and games, you can get pretty close to what the next beat will be in the story. And there were times at Uncharted yeah. where I, I just didn't know where we were going. And um, that's part of what makes it as good as it is. It's if you haven't played it, you got you got to play it. My number four is Horizon Zero Dawn, and this when this game came out at the time was a breath of fresh air for PlayStation first party studios because it wasn't anything that they had done before in terms of an open world you know action RPG. And it was a totally new IP, and it was something that you know people were kind of craving. You know, from Sony was something new, and it has an absolutely beautiful world with you know really interesting world building things to find in maybe the most interesting world building things in a game to find like the artifacts and letters and mm-hmm. you know voice recordings and stuff because the world it's set in America, um, it's set in the United States, but in a different you know, post-apocalypse or whatever. So you're finding things in the, uh, that are relevant to our, our time now, uh, but, you know, in the future. And it was, just, I remember, it was just so clever, the things that they included and how for the characters in the game, it, you know, these things were a mystery because they're, you know, they, they didn't live in our time and in, in the world that we know now. So to them, these things were a mystery, like, you know, ha- like what a what a what a cell phone is and things like that. So, and it was just kind of funny. It would make you like grin and you know, just really really interesting and and cool how they did that stuff. And probably the best that I've seen in a game. And then the combat was very fun, and it would challenge you because you know, especially when you're fighting like these larger robot creatures or whatever, where you had to like find weaknesses on them and use mm-hmm. your different equipment to. You had to use certain equipment or different equipment to, you know, to beat them or to to exploit their weaknesses and knock things off of them, like knock weapons off of them, and then pick the weapon up and and kill them with it. So it was so so well designed and well done. And then the char- the creature and character design, but especially the creatures, was just so good. Um, how everything looked and how it was designed uh, in the art direction. So, and then finally here just. It had an excellent story. It's probably one of the best stories, in my opinion, on the PlayStation 4 from start to finish. And part of it has to do with what I mentioned with like the collectibles, with the artifacts and letters and things like that, building the world. But it really was satisfying and it was a good payoff at the end. And it was easy to keep up with, but there was twists and turns and it was interesting stuff. And I don't know, it was very, very good. I ho- I'm hoping that it's as good in the second one, but. I can't recommend it enough if you like open world um, kind of action, action games. So, my uh, my number three is my uh, second straight game from 2016. It is Battlefield One. Oh, nice! So my my total top five games are games that I was excited about before they came out, that I was super excited about. My top three could be in any order, really, as far as I'm concerned. Same. Battlefield sort of. One, <laughs> Battlefield One, when it came out again, I was in the middle of my World War One stuff that I still I'm still in the middle of basically. But at that point in time, I was going through my World War One aviation phase. So to be able to play a game that had realistic guns from that from that era, had realistic planes from that era, um, and the cool part about the planes was like they really captured like not only how fragile they were because those things were made of like wood and canvas, but like they were, they were fast, but they were slow. If that makes sense. Like Mm -hmm. nothing had ever been that fast in the world ever at that point in time, except for maybe a train, but they're also super slow compared to what you see now. Like you can't use planes today, the way you use planes in battle in world war one. Like that's obvious to say, but they really did a really good job of that. Um, As far as the actual story went, um, you played with a lot of different. Did you play the story all the way through? Yes, I did. So you play as a lot of different characters. Uh, you mm-hmm. pretty much every one of them dies, and they and you're in a different historical battles or situations each of the way through. And of course, that's just to show you that people, everybody died. 
<laughs> and I think that's <laughs> right. what really trying to get across. So, like the first time it happened, I was like, "What? What is happening?" Like, yeah, you're was, like, "What, what am I doing wrong?" Yeah, right. you're like, what, what am I? And the screen would pop up, and it would tell you like you know their name and when they died, and the job that Dice did showcasing everything about World War One. The details mm-hmm. are unbelievable. Like each of the environments that you fight in are insane and the representations of what those places are it's hard to explain like one of the later maps they added was Passchendaele which was at the third battle of of the Somme there was actually three battles there this was the last one and everything is gone it's just mud and sticks and deadly gas and like some pillboxes right like that's what it was the Fort Vado, that the Verdun stuff with all the fire and the rolling hills and like all of that is true to how it how it looks in actual reference photos. If you read the stories, if you read the diaries, all of that is realistic. The way that the cover systems were set up, it's just crazy that they did such a good job on that game, and it makes it even crazier that Battlefield Five sucks so much. But this one is so good, <laughs> right? But and one of the cool things they did with the weapons was like. There weren't attachments to make recoil better or your sights better. Like, nah. Like, you could level the gun up, but you had to be good with the gun to be good with it there. Yeah. Uh, you got what you got. You had to learn to use it. You had to learn its flaws when it was good, when it was bad. Um, don't get me wrong. There were some OP weapons, like the SLME. Like, bro, like, if I got hot with that thing, you're, <laughs> you're just dead. Like, I, I can't help you. Yeah. But we put a billion days into the... I think it said I have 20 days on that game. Oh, shit. Wow. Uh, but yeah, I loved everything about it. It was, again, like, that war is so, it's so close in time, but it feels so far away. It's only 100 years ago. It's not like it's, you know, the Battle of Troy. <laughs> right. And to see the things, like, to use the weapons, like, because when the game came out, the only thing I was worried about would be, was if the weapons would be usable. And um, they were, and they were awesome, and they all felt different, and they all had their own quirks, and everything felt so visceral about it. And the maps were some of the best multiplayer maps we've ever had. They were so big and robust, yeah. and the and like they used vehicles so well on that game. The armored yeah. cars were awesome. The behemoths were fun. They they added a nice challenge. So that game You're had everything. Want to go back and play that one too? Right, Damn. it's free. <laughs> yeah, they had everything I liked about games it had everything I liked about history it was a way for me to visually conceptualize all these things i've read about it's it's a really good showcase like if you're trying to teach a class about this stuff it's a really good showcase because it puts color to these things and when you see something in color versus black and white i think that really hits with people and you can see like the weird stuff like the weird um the weird camo they had on the on the ships, the zigzaggy black and white, like all of that's real. <laughs> yeah. And they thought it would work. They were just trying shit out. Like they had no idea if it would work, right? And people still riding cavalry into battle, like that was a real thing that happened. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's really cool. Um, they did an incredible job of matching history and replicating it. And then they they turned out a game that was I mean, I'll probably never play a multiplayer game online, a multiplayer shooter that I like that much. Number three for me is God of War from 2018. And if the competition weren't so stiff, to be honest with you, this would probably be my number one game. But the competition is rather stiff. So, um, But nevertheless, this game was a huge surprise. And it was pretty much a reimagining of what God of War uh, was and a big time departure from what it had been. Mm-hmm. And it probably had the best and easily the most satisfying combat of any PlayStation 4 game. And that's really saying something when you consider what is out there, like Ghost of Tsushima and Spider-Man and, you know, The Last of Us. God of War takes the cake, by far. Just when you would combine moves and abilities, and it, it made you feel like just an absolute beast. It just felt so good to just decimate these bastards on this game. And... <laughs> just the the weapons and there was a weight to it that it's hard to describe but it felt so good and i know i've recommended this game to you before especially if you like ghost of tsushima you would definitely like this game 
the graphics still to this day are incredible and they'll they'll blow you away they'll impress you even even play, i think even if you played it now on a ps5 and compared it to some of these launch titles like mm-hmm. that have just come out i think you would still be impressed with it and i I still see like pictures that people post on Instagram and stuff today and it still looks incredible. Um, and then really the story kind of, like I mentioned was really a a needed change of pace for the Kratos character and God of war in general, because before Kratos was just like this angry guy that killed shit, you know, and that was it. And then this game made him, you know, human and made him likable and gave him a son and kind of, you know, gave him a personality and some heart (laughs) and, really needed that and it was really a good story from start to finish and set up the sequel very well and then finally the last thing i'll say here about it is that the boss fights in the game and like the set pieces they're incredible they're still i still haven't played anything like some of them today they're stunning and just how you know violent and physical they are and then but also how cinematic they become it's very awesome. It's such a well done game. And that's the reason why, you know, like we talked about last week, God of War Ragnarok is the most anticipated game right now. So can't mm-hmm. cannot recommend it enough, uh, even to you. Flying in at number two, and it was a close choice, but flying in at number two is uh Red Dead Redemption two. Oh man, okay. This game is overwhelming in a in a good way. By that I mean it's incredibly written. Arthur is authentic, um, I think. And you see him develop throughout the game. Uh, you see him go from being a you know a, a loyal bandit to somebody who starts to wonder if what they're doing is the right thing. Um, some people call that maturing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's all kinds of wild stuff. Like the level of detail in the game is silly. It, it's a beautiful looking game in the first place, and. I try not to get too excited about this game because I really like the first one and I got the first one ruined for me. So I didn't want that to happen. So I didn't really watch much. I didn't want to see what the towns looked like. I didn't want to see what the characters looked like. I didn't, I didn't want to do any of that. So when we, I started playing the sure. game and people started popping up, you know, it was like, Oh, there's Dutch. You know what I mean? Like it was a lot more fun that way. Um, yeah. For me at least or like, Oh, there's Marsden. Like, I didn't know any of that was in there until I started playing it because I didn't want to know what was going on. But everything about it is, it's almost hard to explain without playing it. Like the NPCs are super interesting. They all have their own little thing. The random encounters, some of them are hilarious. Some people said the story was too long. Maybe it was a little drawn out. And I guess you can make that argument, but I never played a mission or did a mission that I felt like uh, didn't need to be there. Right. Um, even the side quests, like some of the side quests were a bit annoying because I felt like they were too long. Like I was like, how many more do I need to do for this person or whatever? You know what I mean? Like sometimes you do a side <laughs> yeah. quest and we did 15 for them. But every time that happened at the very last one I would do in the series, something cool would happen or I would get something cool or I would figure something out. Like, or it would be a crazy ass quest that ended up being hilarious or really memorable. So like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was all fine. And like, even though you could use the train or the stagecoach to fast travel in single player, I never did that. I rode my horse everywhere. Oh yeah, um, I got super upset when I lost one of my horses. I was I was not yeah. happy. It was very yeah. not. I was that was unnecessary. First of all, <laughs> but it's great. Like. The combat's fun. I enjoy just fist fighting with people. Um, the shooting is as rock starry as ever. Um, but the thing that makes these rock star games so good is is the open worlds are so interactive. You can do whatever you want. The characters are super relatable somehow. Um, they're super interesting somehow. I mean, when I tell any detail, it's like I put a dead deer on my shirt or on my thing. Put him on the horse's blood on me. Um, the the yeah. horse's balls shrink. Um, yes. <laughs> the tracks in the snow are awesome. Um, you can just fish if you want to. Like you can seriously get on the game, and you can just fish. You don't have to do anything. So yeah, I don't know. I can't say enough about the game, and I haven't really said anything. At the same time, it's just great. Like the level of detail on the guns. The guns are 
beautiful looking. You can do all kinds of carving on them and change stuff. Uh, it's a rock star masterpiece. Every game they put out seems to be a banger. Um, and there's the one cool thing about the game is there's little tie ins to Red Dead. There's tie ins to Red Dead Revolver. Yeah. Because, you know, like on Red Dead Revolver, like you couldn't go into the buildings. Mm-hmm. And when you'd walk up to a door, it would tell you whatever, you know, it would say like uh, clothes about sheriff or whatever. And then uh, there'd be certain buildings you couldn't go to into on Red Dead Redemption. And it would say like, you know, closed by the sheriff or gone fishing, which is like stuff you would get on the first game. They added <laughs> little, in, little details and all the lore behind it is what makes it. It has a depth to it that like you could li- literally play the game and not know any of that stuff. Yeah. And ha- have a great time. Absolutely. But knowing that like, you know, like when I meet the guy that's walking around yelling Gavin and I don't know why. It's so cool to like try to figure that out or is that related to the last red dead um is the time traveler from gta Mm. you know all kinds of stuff like that like you know that was one of the thoughts i had could he be from gta like what what is that weird cult that you can find up in the hills like maybe he's a part of that cult and he time traveled yeah so that's funny there's a billion different things about this game you could go on about for you know we could do a whole podcast uh with twenty thousand parts just about this game um I don't even know where to finish or where to start. It's big and beautiful, and if you haven't played it, I don't know what you're doing. My number two is The Last of Us, part two, appropriately. And, you know, again, this game also has a case for number one, in my opinion, on my list. Um, It's probably the best showcase game for what the PS4 can do. Uh, not to mention the best showcase for really what games as a media can bring to the table. Just in terms of the production value in the game, you know, the animation, the graphics, the storytelling, it's fantastic. Uh, it was a stunning game. It's a beautiful game. It's a violent game. It was defeating. It was uplifting. It was somehow all of those things, which is what really impressed me probably the most. The story is so good. It's very memorable. And then, like I've said before, my really only knock on it is that possibly it may be just a little bit too long. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's I don't know if that's really so much of, as a, of a complaint. Uh, or a criticism as it is just kind of a personal complaint. You know, the game, as I have also mentioned before, the game is just an absolute masterclass in animation and in gameplay. And there are things and little touches in, in that happen in the game that I've never seen a game do before or mm-hmm. at least account for before. You know, when someone, if you're hiding under a car and someone pokes their head down and you are aiming your gun at them, they're, they're going to recoil back in fear and they may fall over on the ground and drop their weapon, like stuff like that. That's cool. And, you know, just, it's so cool. Like they thought about all this stuff and it's, it's really just Rockstar and Naughty Dog at the very top that can do this stuff, and it's so impressive. And so that really just blew me away and still blows me away. It's, it's, it's a game that will constantly impress you in little ways and in big ways, and it's a can't-miss game. It's a masterpiece. You have to play it. Mm-hmm. So I can't really recommend it any more than that. All right, my number one game. Here we go. What everybody's been waiting for. I'm really curious. You, yeah. What is this? What is this shit? Um, a number one game of all time on the PlayStation Four is Ghost of Tsushima. Oh, okay, yeah. The Ghost of Tsushima's. Um, it has. We can just start with some little bitty things. Um, one of the best photo modes on in a game. Uh, you could change the environment. You can change the lighting. Yada 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 yada. Whatever yeah. you want to do. It's so wide open that it's overwhelming and i can't use it um because i don't know what to do with it <laughs> and i can't use it um, uh. <laughs> i will say that um and you mentioned some of this stuff before but it's one of the best looking landscapes on on playstation um they yeah. did a great job with the world um, it feels very visceral um it feels very japanese which is the point mm-hmm. and some of the historical stuff they got really accurate um the Mongols did invade Tsushima Island. That is where they started on their Japanese invasion. All that's this while the story isn't true, there's a lot of aspects that are true. The way the Mongols fought, uh, the roving bands, the what they did to the people, the the ships, um, all that stuff was realistic. The the Mongol ships they had that they showed, those that's what they were. That's what they looked like. 
the armor was dead on like all that stuff is 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 accurate to a t and then that's the kind of detail you want to see when you're doing like these historical fiction games yeah and they had like these little these these details they didn't have to do like when you're doing the bard side quests and they do those animations of the storyboard that's like on papyrus or whatever yeah like they don't have to add that stuff in they could have just showed him talking and you could have had text right but those yeah. little those little things are what made it really really fun for me um and the fun part of the game for me was like as you're going through the missions in the story you're building your own legend you're becoming the ghost and like the rpg yes. kind of level ups that you do like of course you have your freedom to put them where you want and and that's nice it's any rpg but as i got farther in the game at no point did i feel like i was too powerful and at no point did i feel like the enemy was too powerful does that make sense like yeah as i got better they seemed to get better and yeah I that's agree. awesome like i i don't like it when i get to things that i can't do if that makes sense do you know what i'm saying yeah um, that's really irritating for me in games because it's like you know if you're supposed to be this big hero right shouldn't you be not that you should be inv- invincible but you know like if you're john mcclain like oh i went to the wrong <laughs> level of the tower and i got my head blown off like that's not realistic so all right um, anyway i thought the um the 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 balancing act between honor and tradition and doing what you need to save your people is something that is very true to Japanese culture and very true to many warring cultures. Something that people deal with now, whether it's, you know, sticking with your family tradition or going out to do what you want to do. Um, I think that's something that people can relate to. And that part of the story I think is endearing for people. The actual fighting itself is like you said, it's incredible. It's, some of the best fighting mechanics as far as smooth goes smoothness the ability to chain and react is some of the best i've played on the playstation 4 and part of what makes that so good is the different stances you unlock yes um being able once you learn to okay this guy is this type of fighter or this type of armor i need to switch he has this kind of weapon i need to switch to win stance or being able to do those things fluidly and get them right that's what makes it so satisfying and also being able to change like between stealth and just going in loud, um, that keeps it from getting dull for me. Um, I can see, I've heard I've heard people say like, oh well, it gets kind of old when you do the same thing over and over again. To me, that's like that's on you. Like, yeah, like try to go stealthy and take over a whole encampment in stealth mode. Like that's fun for me to do to to kind of change it up. Or if I'm frustrated and I can't do it, like I know there was a couple I tried to do stealthily that I don't think the game just wanted me to do. <laughs> And finally, I got wouldn't pissed let off. You. Yeah, so I just went in loud, and that, I guess that's what it wanted me to do. But um, all the side quests I had to do, all the side characters, um, all the side characters were interesting. I never, I never trusted the guy that taught me archery. Hmm. I never trusted the uncle. I didn't really like either of those guys. Um, oddly enough, the Mongol guy, like the Mongol guy, was so sure of himself. I felt like the uncle at times was a little bit like a boomer. Like he couldn't adjust <laughs> yeah. to the world and it pissed me off. It's like <laughs> he would rather lose his entire uh, way of life because of a way they used to fight a hundred years ago. It's like, dude, come on. Right. That stuff annoyed me. Um, but that's, that would, that annoys me in life. So it's not like it's, it's a game issue. That's, and that's, I think they wanted you to be annoyed by him. I think they wanted you to make a decision. You know, they did. Um, there are parts of the story that were, hard to be a part of hard to watch um we went on the whole emotional journey and then the different things like they had the level climbing that you get in sucker punch games when you're going to the altars or trying to find the foxes or whatever so they had Mm -hmm. a bunch of different elements they mixed up different stuff um the different like you said the um ronin battles were a lot of fun the boss battles so so to speak those were pretty cool um I, I really liked getting on top of buildings and then jumping down and taking people out. <laughs> right. With the sword down their neck. Right. Or calling them out when you walk up to the gates and taking out like five in a row by the end of the game. So, um, <laughs> yeah, like there's some crazy stuff on there. Um, using the Hawacha was a lot of fun. Um, the Hawacha was something that was a mythicized as a, as a weapon for a long time until the last couple hundred years when they actually found archaeological evidence that it was real they'd only have like writings and stuff about it so 
to see one of those actually perform and the way it would have and how it would have been used is like just those little details took it over the top for me. Um, it is a game I thought about. I couldn't wait to play. I was excited for it to come out. It did everything I wanted it to do. And it wasn't like, it was difficult, but it wasn't like, um, it wasn't mind numbingly difficult. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, my number one, the big reveal here, my number one PS4 game of all time is, as you might imagine, Red Dead Redemption 2. And it's it was probably never in doubt, truth be told, <laughs> that it's my number one, considering that I have over 850 hours into the game. Yeah. But between the single player and the online. And just quite frankly, it's a masterpiece. And it... It can't. It's a can't miss game, and it won't be outclassed by anybody except Rockstar. Mm-hmm. Whenever they re- release the third one in probably eight or ten years. And what I'll say about it is that the single player story is epic, kind of like you've mentioned, and the world is just so incredibly dynamic and reactive mm-hmm. to what what you do and who you choose to interact with, and the, the decisions that you make and how you. I guess how you act. <laughs> yeah, like your honor. Yeah, and even how you ride your horse through a town or if you pull <laughs> your gun out somewhere you're not supposed to. And that is just so incredible. It will it will blow you away how the world reacts to you and how just the dynamism that's in the game design. So that is just that might be the most impressive part of it. And mm-hmm. like you said, the living, you know, how the world is just alive around you. And, you know, the extent to which you can interact with the world is, is, is just what's so impressive about it. And, uh, and the gameplay and sound design are both phenomenal. The weapons sound incredible, Mm -hmm. especially if you're playing in a headset and you hear that shotgun go (laughs) off and like, you'll hear it echo off a hill or a mountain or whatever. And gosh, man, it's, it's just awesome. And then they have, there's a weight to the guns. There's a weight to the melee combat. Uh, you know, how you move, how the horses move. It's just, it's just so good. It feels and sounds good to just be in the world in general, really. Uh, and then, you know, the animation and the graphical fidelity are both top notch, of course. And then, like I've said before, you know, Rockstar and Naughty Dog are just leading the way there. And it's just not even close. And then um, it's got probably the best mission design in a video game mm-hmm. to date, you know, to date. Um, like you were kind of talking about, you know, it's got all these cool missions and side quests and um, some do drag on, but there's just humor at times and then there's, you know, things that surprise you and I don't know, it's just great. And then uh, just kind of, you know, final here, it's, you know, th- it's just got an excellent story with so many memorable moments and kind of big parts that you know, you'll remember through the whole story and they kind of stick with you things that you do and how characters development and then kind of plot twists and whatever. So it just gives you such an, a sense of like investment in the world and the characters uh, as you play through it. And if you haven't played it, you're an idiot. That's all. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how else to play it. If you don't chew big red, then fuck you. Like, <laughs> if you haven't played Red Dead, you are truly missing out. I cannot recommend it enough. Probably both of us, it sounds like. And it's probably my favorite game, my number one game, not only on the PS4, but of all time. So that's how strongly I feel about it. And there you have it. That is our top 10 personal ps4 games of all time travis's and mine and we had a pretty pretty good differentiated list there for the most part we had just Mm -hmm. a few overlap but we both had a lot of variety there so and that's going to uh wrap it up for this special christmas day episode and uh we'll we'll plan to get back to our normal news focused episode next week for the new year but if you guys enjoyed this episode this kind of bonus episode here be sure that you subscribe uh, so that you don't miss any episodes and also leave us a review and then finally if you don't mind why not share us with a friend who may enjoy a podcast such as this where they typically can get all the playstation news in less than 90 minutes a week or on this occasion they can get a nice little ps4 top 10 list here 
If you guys want to reach out to us, you can do that on Twitter at the DualSense Pod. If you want to try and catch us play some games or stream, you can do that on YouTube at the DualSense Podcast. You guys take care. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday. We'll talk at you next week.